What's up guys, I'm Ira Rochelle and this is Nuggets of Truth. In part one, we went through the full armor of God, explaining the purpose of each piece of armor, as well as the purpose of the order in which the armor of God is given to us. And in part two, we went into detail explaining the second use of the sword of the spirit, which is praying in the spirit. But for the sake of time, we didn't get into the two other uses of the sword of the spirit, prayer and supplication. So let's just dive right into this. The sword of the spirit is found in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 through 20. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So as stated in part one, the sword of the spirit is the last piece of spiritual armor that Paul tells us to put on. This means that this is the only piece of spiritual armor that you have to have the helmet of salvation in order to use. In part two, we explain that the second use of the armor is praying in the spirit and what that means. Now let's get into the third use of the sword of the spirit, prayer. My initial definition of prayer was just communion with God. It was just having a conversation with him. Prayer to me was just talking to God, but after looking into it, prayer is actually a very specific way of talking to God. The word prayer here is the Greek word on the screen, which means petition. Many people may think that this isn't a big deal, right? But this is actually a really big deal. A lot of people don't actually like to ask God for things. They feel like they're bothering him, but that's the very purpose of prayer, is to make your petition known to God. It's to ask for what you need. Why? Because it teaches us to depend on God and not ourselves. It teaches us to depend on God and not others. The first time that this Greek word for prayer is actually used is in the book of Matthew by Jesus. Matthew chapter 21 verse 12 through 17. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never heard out of the mouth of infants? and nursing babies who have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Jesus was very specific with his words. He said, house of prayer and den of robbers. Now, if we go to the Gospel of John, we find that Jesus actually did this earlier, but he didn't call them robbers. John chapter 2 verse 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making a whip of cords. He drove them out of the temple with the sheep and oxen and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The first time Jesus does this, he calls it a house of trade. 
This is more so implying that the temple had become about making money. It had become a business instead of a holy place, instead of the house of God. Whereas in his second encounter recorded by Matthew, he specifically calls it a den of robbers. Now the word den is the Greek word on the screen which means cave what i find interesting about this word is that it's only used six times in scripture once in matthew that we just read once in mark and once in luke stating the same accusation in the temple once in john when referring to the cave that lazarus was laid in once in hebrews when the author tells of the faith of gideon barak samson jephthah david samuel and the prophets Hebrews chapter 11 verse 37 to 38 They were stoned they were sawn in two they were killed with the sword they went about in skins of sheep and goats destitute afflicted mistreated of whom the world was not worthy wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth Revelation chapter 6 verse 12 through 17 says when he opened the sixth seal I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains calling to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand now i want you to keep in mind how this word den is used in scripture a den of robbers, a place to lay the dead, and a place to hide from the wrath of someone. Now the word robber is the Greek word on the screen, which means robber. This Greek word is used 15 times in scripture, four times in Matthew, once in the verse we read earlier, once when Jesus is being arrested and he essentially is asking why they came out to arrest him like he's a robber, and then twice when referring to the two robbers that Jesus was crucified with. Then three times in Mark, all three are used in the same instances as Matthew. Then four times in Luke, twice in the story of the Good Samaritan, once when he calls the temple a den of robbers, once when he's being arrested, then three times in John, twice in the parable of the good shepherd once in the description of barabbas the man jesus took the place of on the cross and lastly once in second corinthians when paul explains the hardships he has experienced for the sake of the gospel now the two verses i want to focus on are john's account john chapter 10 verse 1 through 10 Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of the strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus says that he has two different positions in this parable, but I really just want to focus on the first position so that I don't get tempted into any rabbit holes. Jesus says that he is the door to the sheepfold. 
Jesus then explains that anyone who doesn't enter through him but climbs in through another way is a thief and a robber. So let's now pull all the information we have based on what we've just read and learned. Jesus called the temple a den of robbers because they had found safety, security, and a resting place and something that didn't belong to them. Here, let me further explain what Jesus was talking about. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 8 through 15. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this place, which is called by my name, and say we are delivered? Only to go on doing all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Go now to my place that was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at first, and see what I did to it because of the evil of my people Israel. And now because you have done all these things, declares the Lord, and when I spoke to you, persistently you did not listen and when i called you you did not answer therefore i will do to the house that is called by my name and in which you trust and to the place that i gave to you and to your fathers as i did to shiloh and i will cast you out of my sight as i cast out all your kinsmen all the offspring of ephraim now i'm well aware that isaiah says my house shall be called a house of prayer but to ignore Jeremiah quoting the Lord, saying that they make it a den of robbers, I think would miss the full picture. The Lord, through the prophet Jeremiah, explains what this phrase, making it a den of robbers, means. He says that because the people put their trust and their faith in other things, as well as lived in sin, yet still expected to enter the house of the Lord and remain in his presence in his love, they made the temple of God a den of robbers. Now some will say, how can we even begin to compare the two? No account in any of the gospels says that they were doing this. Well, actually, yes, yes, they do. Each one does. Look at how Jesus says it, Matthew chapter 21, verse 13. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Both Mark and Luke say the same exact thing. And no, this isn't just Jesus taking the prophets out of context. If you ever hear a preacher or a teacher or anyone say that, run. Jesus did not ever take the word of God out of context. He literally is the word of God made flesh. John chapter 1 verse 1 through 18. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 19 verse 10. Because your testimony is what you have done and Jesus is the word of God. Therefore he fulfills prophecy which is why the spirit of prophecy is his testimony. So how on God's beautiful green earth can the word of God take himself out of context? Or how can he, whose testimony is the very spirit of prophecy, take a prophet out of context? Therefore, Jesus, understanding what was happening in the present and what happened in the past, made a connection so that we could understand why he was so upset and why he used the wording he did. If it was just about selling, then why didn't he just use the same terminology he did earlier, recorded in the book of John? Why didn't he just use that same wording and call it a house of trade? Because that's not what he was talking about. Jesus was talking about going through another way than through him. The people there understood this because look at what they did after he said this. Matthew chapter 21 verse 12 through 17. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies 
you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. After he drove out the money changers, the blind and lame came into the temple to him, and he healed them. You see the connection? Jesus said in John 10 that we read earlier that he was the door to the sheepfold. Everybody that tries to enter in through a different way is a thief and a robber. When he comes into the temple and sees all that's taking place, he drives out the buyer and the seller, flips money changers tables and the seats of the pigeon sellers, and then he says that they've made the house of the Lord, which is supposed to be a house of prayer, they've made it a den of robbers. Now when the people outside, they hear this, they come into the temple to Jesus in order to receive a healing. They understood what Jesus was getting at. They understood the point he was making. Jesus is the way to salvation, the way to healing, and he is the only supplier of all of our needs. When we try to receive these things through any other avenue other than Jesus, we become a robber. This is the importance of understanding the value of prayer. Look at what James says, James chapter 4 verse 1 through 8. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. You spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you not suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealousy over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So what is James getting at? We don't have things because we don't ask. And when we do ask, we ask with ill intent. We ask for our own gain, to increase and satisfy our own greed, because we want the world instead of the things of God. Now look at what Jesus says, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God, who clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat and what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus is saying the same thing that James is. When you ask, make sure it's not rooted in a selfish and sinful passion. Instead, let it be for the kingdom of God. Because when we put the kingdom of God and his righteousness first, all the things that we need will be added to us. Now let's dig a little deeper into how to pray or petition the Lord. 
James chapter 1 verse 2 through 8 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Prayer is more than just petitioning God. We also have to have faith. We have to pray without doubt that we will receive. James says that the person who prays but doubts that he will receive what he has prayed for is unstable in all his ways. If he's unstable in all of his ways, then his house can't be built on the rock that cannot be shaken. On that firm foundation that cannot be moved, it can't be built on Jesus. Matthew chapter 7 verse 24 through 27 and Luke chapter 6 verse 46 through 49. In other words, prayer, making your petition known to the Lord, will not be heard or answered if you ask in order to gain the world or you ask with doubt. Now, some will say, doesn't Jesus promise to give us anything we ask for? Well, no, not really. Matthew chapter seven, verse seven through 11 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? I want you to notice what Jesus says. Jesus says everyone who asks, receives, and then finishes that thought with, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Jesus specifically says that our Heavenly Father will give us good things. Good things do not include worldly things. James clarifies this for us in the rest of his letter that we read earlier. James chapter 4 verse 4 through 10. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. James, after telling us why we ask, but we don't receive, explains it's because we not only desire a friendship with the world, but we have a friendship with the world. And because this is our desire and our action, we have made ourselves an enemy of God. Therefore, our prayers go unheard and unanswered. How we act affects whether or not God hears and answers our prayers. For God doesn't hear nor answer his enemy. He only hears and answers his friends. John 15 verse 13 through 16. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friend. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Jesus makes it very clear that his friends obey his commands. Because they do this, they bear fruit and remain in him in his love. This is essential to understand because Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And apart from the vine, the branches can do nothing. 
John chapter 15, verse 1 through 17. When we complete these necessary actions, then and only then will the Father not only hear our prayers, but answer our prayers. Let's read one more verse about prayer. Psalms chapter 37, verses 3 through 5. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. David made it very clear that there is an action that we have to do before we will receive the desires of our hearts, which is delight ourselves in the Lord. Why does this matter? Because our heart's desire changes when we delight ourselves in the Lord. We begin to change. We begin to be molded into his image instead of remaining in our sin-ridden state of being. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 and 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18. This is why God promises that he will give us a new heart and put a new spirit in us. In Ezekiel chapter 11 verse 19 through 20 and Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 26. Only when our hearts begin to change do the desires of our hearts begin to be answered and given to us. For more on the desires of our heart and why our heart has diverse change, check out our video, Can You Listen to Your Heart, which is under our Not For The Week Of Heart category. So let's just sum everything up for you guys real quick. Prayer is much more than just talking to God. It's bringing your petition to him. It's asking for what you need, your heart's desire. But prayer only works when your request isn't rooted in selfishness or in gaining the world. Instead, it must be rooted in furthering the kingdom of God and his righteousness and coupled with faith and no doubt. In other words, we have to be in obedience with God's word. And we have to delight in him, seeking to further his kingdom and righteousness instead of ourselves in order to have our prayers answered. We have to be friends of God and not friends of the world in order to ask and receive. Prayer isn't selfish unless we make it selfish. God knows that we have needs. God knows that we have petitions that we desire answered. He already knows these things. He wants us to bring our petitions to him. He doesn't want us to seek out another way to receive these things because he wants us to trust in him and not others. He wants to put our faith in him and not in ourselves or someone or something else because if we go through another avenue other than through him, the door, we become a robber and a thief. We, the temple of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, make ourselves a den of robbers. We are the pinnacle of his creation. He came down to earth, took our form, and died for us. He didn't do that for anyone else. Therefore, make your petitions known to God. Ask with humility, faith, and in obedience. Then and only then will we begin to see our prayers answered. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and if you did, please feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel. And until next time, God bless.